Okay, so I think Ben has already given a complete introduction. One thing I should say from Linaro is that we are currently hiring, so if anyone is looking for work on this, <laughs> do let us know. <laughs> so probably people who are here will already know about this, but let's, over, let's go over it quickly, why would we want to do this. GCC is a good enough compiler, but uh, you can make the point that some competition can never hurt, and if nothing else, uh, Clang outperforming GCC in one particular area will allow the GCC people to see what they could be doing. And then, of course, parts of Android are already built with Clang because they want to integrate with GPU code that's using LLVM, and that tendency is probably just going to increase. So at some point, more and more will be compiled with Clang automatically. And of course, just using a couple of different compilers will show different warnings uh, that indicate bad code that needs to be fixed and that could even uh, choke uh, when it's built with compilers that take it. So, first problem I've run into is that since GCC has been the only relevant compiler for so long, people have come to believe that everything that works in GCC is fine, even if it's stuff like this. Defining a multidimensional array and then referencing its members uh, by parameters that are completely outside of the real scope. <laughs> GCC 4.8 actually broke this as well. So chances are this will get fixed automatically wherever it appears, but earlier versions of GCC didn't even complain. Next thing is, Android uses a rather weird system of make files uh, that is not that easy to adapt to different compilers. So my approach there was uh, to just not touch the make file system and instead write a little wrapper around Clang that takes exactly the same parameters GCC likes, uh, just point it to that toolchain. That wrapper is available at the Git repository uh, listed here. And we're also running daily builds of toolchains uh, using the wrapper that you, uh, you can just download and then point the Android build procedure at. Those builds are supposed to be fairly complete, including even extensions like Poly. If there's any bug with them, just let me know. There's another possible pitfall that people will run into easily because uh, Clang accepts the ARM Linux Android EABI target that you would generally use for GCC, but internally it's alias to ARM Linux GNU EABI, which is pretty close, but it's not exactly the same. There's a couple of uh, differences that you can see when you look at GCC source, uh, seeing what GCC does there. Like Android EABI forces enum sizes to 32 bits, while on regular Linux, the uh, size of an enum is uh, dynamic. So if all the values used are from 0 to 255, it's actually 8 bits. If all the values are from 0 to 65,000, uh, whatever, it's uh, 16 bits. But for Android, it's supposed to be 32, and Dalvik actually has code that relies on this because it casts stuff around, casts an enum to a UN32, and then checks uh, bits set in some things. Mm. Another thing is Android just does dash FPIC by default, which is another thing that causes some weird problems when you don't know about it. But so the solution there is that Clang actually supports the right things. But it just doesn't know that Android needs them, so the fix is to add them to the wrappers uh, and just make sure that when the target is Android, we add dash f, uh, f no short enums, which causes the 32-bit size enums, and dash f pick to uh, generate pick code. Another related thing is that GCC has a couple of the, uh, defines that can be used to 
check the availability of some extensions in the CPU. Like the, when you're using GCC and you're targeting Cortex A9 or A15, you automatically have a define underscore underscore arm underscore feature underscore DSP that you can check for. And there's a couple of other things for, for big endian targets and for IW MMXT, which is obviously not very relevant anymore, but still used in some code. So I didn't want to touch the clan code too much, so I just added those features in the wrapper as well. So right now the wrapper scans uh, command line arguments and sees if the target is Cortex A whatever and not Cortex M and then defines ARM feature DSP on the command line. Next, there's a couple of constructs that GCC accepts, but uh, the standard doesn't accept, and Clang follows the standard a bit closer, like arithmetic on void pointers. The thing you want to do there is just cast them to character pointers because uh, you want to add single byte. Uh, yeah. Mm. Next issue is that an array of characters and a pointer to characters are not the same thing, even if GCC lets you get away with using them interchangeably. Then GCC accepts a couple of C++11 features, even when you are not using dash std equals C++11 or GNU++11. So when you're using this sort of initializer, just put an equal sign in there or just uh, force the code to uh, C++11 mode. A question here? It makes a lot more sense to just use C++11 mode instead of changing it to not be C++11. For the most part, yes, but in some cases it also makes sense to change the code because there's other constructs in the code that will not work with uh, C++11 compliance enabled. Like uh, Android has a couple of things where Character 16T is used and on C++ before 11, uh, that was an alias to uint 16T, uh, while in C++ 11, it's actually a type by itself and casting to uint 16T then causes some issues. I would, I would encourage the use of the C++ 11 because it'll make your code faster just by turning it on because move illusion, because um, move semantics will be there, so. Yeah, I agree. It's just yeah. a matter of uh, trying to stick as close to upstream code as possible, making it easier to upstream uh, versus uh, doing the right thing for the longer term. <laughs> <laughs> so then there's a couple of GCC extensions that are being used in a couple of things that Clang currently doesn't support. We've already seen most of them in the other talks of the session, named registers which might actually be added in a future version of Clang. Some people were not really opposed to that. Variable length array instructs. Okay, we've just covered that extensively. Then nested functions. That's another thing that's probably not too commonly used uh, in the Android code base. It's only in elf utils, and I've also tried to compile a lot of the open Mandriva code base using Clang, and there are also I didn't run into this in many packages. Much real heard that, sorry. I was just asking about if, if we were going to hear about nested functions in Debian. Um, so you haven't run into that issue. Okay, well, you will have, okay, thanks. Well, what's the fix? It says the fix at the end just unnest them. Yeah, the fix is to just uh, not use nested functions by moving them outside and uh, making the parameters they are using uh, actual um, additional parameters to the function being invoked, which obviously slows things down a little bit and makes the code a bit uglier, so the, there's a good chance to receive upstreams more enough to year award for trying to upstream that but it seems to be the only way to go about this. <laughs> yeah, that, that's certainly what we had to do in the um, ACPI code for ThinkPad, was to do exactly what you, you described there, adding extra um, parameters and such. 
Yeah, nested functions are super, super evil and are super dangerous to use in, in the kernel for reasons that have been explained to me once, but I don't remember. But the only solution is to just unnest them. Yeah, I mean, I, I, th I think that even most of the GCC guys would agree that you shouldn't use nested functions. So I, I, th I think that, that widely among the compiler guys, they'll tell you not to. Yeah, maybe another thing we should be doing is talk to the GCC guys and make them emit a warning whenever they see a nested function. So That's true. Unfor unfortunately, oh. nested functions are a documented feature in GCC, despite not being in the standard, they're documented. So that's one of the reasons people use them. And um, I was actually told at the, the last time I gave this talk, uh, I had previously been led to believe that they had been added because of the ADA port. Apparently nested functions in, in GCC predate the ADA port, so they were actually a uh, intentional feature that was added to GCC, I, I was told by a GCC uh, guy. Now, next thing I've seen is uh, functions are being used before they are being declared or prototyped. Like this invocation in G uh, GCC uh, generates an implicit uh, declaration and Clang says, okay, the, the uh, return type is different, so that should actually be a conflict, which is probably the right thing to do. So maybe again, case for GCC people, the, uh, uh, adding another warning. Then variable length arrays of non-part elements is pretty much a variation of uh, variable length arrays and structures. Also, fortunately, is seen only in one source file, and there it is fairly easy to fix by just uh, turning the thing into a pointer and allocating with new and delete. Another thing that... So variable length arrays are now part of C++. So the code should stay and just be compiled with the new version of C++. Yeah. C++ 14? Okay, so the next standard is C++ 14, apparently. Okay, next thing. The, uh, GCC doesn't make a difference between a class and a struct statement. It could be argued that there shouldn't be a difference because they are the same thing with different default visibility and visibility isn't anywhere in the ABI. But uh, Clang likes pointing this out. It's just a warning, but a lot of code uh, that uses this, for example, in Bionic and the PCC uh, uses dash W error, so it actually errors out and just fixing it to be consistent is probably the better thing to do anyway. Then the rules for symbol visibility and coexistence symbol resolution rules seem to be slightly different. Sometimes I'm not exactly clear on who is following the standard and who is not. Like um, in Bionic, a couple of functions like underscore, underscore, kernels, NDF, are declared in a couple of places, and uh, GCC seems to detect that uh, they're actually identical functions and just uh, throws one definition out while Clang says, okay, there's multiple definitions, I'm not going to take this. Mm. One fix was to just uh, declare it static inline, uh, so uh, the symbol doesn't get pulled in and there's no uh, duplicate symbols. Some code in Bionic as well uses underscore underscore weak reference and underscore underscore strong reference, which don't exist in Clangs, but it is easy to just copy the definition from GCC because those are implemented as a macro even in GCC, so that shouldn't be a problem. And then we have one rather interesting line of code static const int digits 10 equals digits 10 int, uh, which causes a compile error in Clang because Clang assumes that this 
right hand digit 10 is actually a reference to the left hand thing and then the uh, things that, uh, that's not a template so giving a template parameters is not supposed to work um, so on one hand it's uh, digits 10 is a template type that's uh, supposed to take a couple of arguments Wait, uh, is is it so so is is how is that never mind this is the, i'm getting to a c++ question i think clang is wrong yeah sounds like you guys should talk about that more afterwards yeah, yeah. i'd also guess it's wrong but the, there's a simple workaround that won't disturb any compiler by just um, making sure we are not inside the namespace where this is being defined and this is in the top level namespace, so actually Kling might be right. Got to check the standard. <laughs> but just adding this workaround will work with both compilers. Then there's a API difference in the bundwind that is actually used in a couple of places in Android. For example, in uh, Bionic and in the dynamic linker, GCC uses uh, unwind get IP on a context where in Clang only has a more verbose variant, which is uh, unwind VRS get. But since the, this letter construct does exactly the same as the former, maybe we should just add a define in Clang's lib unwind that defines unwind get IP to this thing. Then Clang emits a couple of warnings that GCC doesn't emit. Sometimes they're really good, sometimes not that nice. Like here, the, um, there's one code path um, where the variable adder would not be initialized. Clang notices it and points it out. But in this particular case, it is nonsense because the switch ends in DVM abort, which in turn uh, calls an assert statement. So that code path is actually impossible to hit. One of the fixes is to initialize the variable, which actually generates an additional instruction. So if it's really timing sensitive code, you don't want to do this. And the other is to just not use dash w error for the time being <laughs> until this is fixed. And lastly, there's a couple of bugs. Got a question, sorry. If it's an abort function, why isn't it marked as no return and then Clang can detect that and not complain about it? Yeah, it's marked no return, so the, uh, I'm so why is Clang not sure why Clang is not, uh, not seeing it. Um, I'm pretty sure Clang is complaining because Clang doesn't care whether you've got a uh, whether it's marked as unreachable. If it thinks that it's uninitialized, um, it it thinks you should initialize it, and it's probably right. So I, I, I suspect that, that, that it, it it it's just that the the code is intentionally saying, yeah, we don't we don't care. If you, if you just set it to something at the at the case of the abort, either even just right after the abort. You're not going to ever get a performance penalty for it. It's just it'll never hit it. It'll just satisfy Clang. Well, yes, you can uh, just initialize it there, and then uh, the only penalty you get is uh, a couple of extra bytes in the file size. Right. The other workaround where you get a little performance penalty is just initializing the variable on the uh, construction. Yeah. Yeah. There's plenty of code bases which have like abort in case statements because, I mean, it's the same thing as DV, uh, that abort or the built-in abort where they basically say no return so we're not going to bother initializing variables that after this case statement will be used. I mean, if, it's, if Clang is warning in those, that just sounds like Clang is broken. Yeah, uh, I only found two of those statements in the entire Android code base and actually well, I mean, not just Android code base, but other code bases. I mean, I use that construct myself personally. I've seen it in other libraries. Hmm. Yeah, probably they just don't use dash w error by default and uh, therefore people don't see it that easily. <laughs> hmm. 
Okay, so, uh, so sounds like we should follow up on that somewhere, though. Okay, good. Yeah, I'll be added to the notes. Lastly, uh, every compiler has its own share of bugs, uh, so we are running into some things that really look like they're clang bugs, uh, two bugs that are already filed, uh, but can be worked around by just turning off optimizations. Then one issue is rather weird needs further investigation, getting undefined references on functions that are defined underscore underscore inline in the same file. So those should be visible, but uh, apparently uh, somehow a call to an external function is defined while they're still being inlined. And the workaround is to just make them static, which obviously is not exactly the same thing. It, uh, causes an extra function call. So we face similar issues. Can you give me more insight into that? Is this is some function outside of this file calling that function? No. OK. So, so this actually seems to be a bug. Hmm. OK, I'll, we'll talk offline. I'm kind of interested in that. Yeah. And I've only observed this on uh, Clang 3.4 trunk. So in 3.3, .3 it's not there. So that's another indication that it's actually a bug. But I didn't get around to the creating a smaller test case, so it's yet. There's a similar issue in E2FS procs, uh, which might be related because uh, it's also some external declarations of functions that are implemented in line that were just causes undefined references when linking. And again, the, the workaround is to just make them static functions for the time being. So after that, we are in a state where it compiles, where we can build nice images. But there's just one little detail uh, when we flash it to a device that doesn't boot. <laughs> I actually have an idea of what's going on there now. Uh, and actually, my computer is sitting right there compiling a version that might have a fix. So there might be an update on this later today. He's always working, but folks. <laughs> so overall results uh, probably will not change that much. The image size is slightly larger than a built with GCC 4.7. I haven't tried GCC 4.8 because it doesn't compile a bootable Exynos 5 kernel at the moment, and the target of this was uh, Nexus 10. And the build time is significantly faster with all optimizations enabled. The GCC takes about 90 minutes on a fast machine, and Clang takes 60 minutes. Now, yeah. so that's the current state of Android user land and Clang. Does anyone have questions, uh, ideas for fixes? Yes. Actually, Android does that a lot because, for example, it compiles libpng with Clang b uh, by default, while the rest of the system is compiled with GCC because uh, they want to pull in some code there. Of actually um, going through the libraries and essentially compiling one with with Clang, linking it in, making sure it it works, yeah, you know, and then just going down the list. That's one of the things to do to figure out what's going on. Yeah, but I'm fairly sure that uh, what this would result in is uh, Bionic is the one that's being broken because uh, it doesn't even boot to init, so it's yeah. either init breaking or Bionic breaking. Gotcha. <laughs> yeah. And Bionic is where the thing I just f uh, fixed last night is, so... Where was your fix? That was another thing in the wrapper where the uh, dash F pick wasn't being forced correctly, oh, right. so the, uh, we had some non-shareable uh, piece of code in a shared library, which would be expected to break things badly. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Um, just to note with regards to Clang and GCC compatibility, the Clang and GCC are going to only interoperate if you're using the GCC standard library, C++ standard library, which 
can become a problem sometimes because Clang does not always interoperate with said standard library correctly. So they'll usually interoperate, but you have to be somewhat careful um, because you can easily run into issues on Linux with that. Yeah, in the case of Android, that's actually not much of an issue because Android has its own versions of those libraries anyway, so they're not actually being used. Which but has its own point issues for regular Linux builds. Which is its own issues in some ways. I mean, I, I know why they do that, but essentially they're doing their own thing again, unfortunately. Yeah. <laughs> and actually, the, uh, the C++ library is the thing where there might be room for optimization in Android, because right now they decided to kick out the GNU STL because it's GPL licensed and they don't want that. But, uh, instead, they put in STL port, which is rather obsolete and Sorry. slow. So putting did in you, Did clanks. you just say that they kicked out recently? Lib standard C++? Is that no, a recent No, it was thing? kicked out uh, from the first build of Android. Okay. okay, sorry, yeah. Because if they had just done it now, they could have at least gone for LLVM's li Lib C++. Yeah, but, but that's what I was just getting to. So kicking out STL port uh, and replacing it with Lib C++ might be quite a performance boost. But obviously, it's going to break binary compatibility, so people who use the NDK won't like it too much. Oh. Well, my original question was on the, the C++ library as well. Is it possible to interoperate the other way with, with the Clang C++ library if, if you build GCC knowing that it, that's going to be the library? The last time I checked, and I, I'm pretty sure that this has changed and that these days they're more interoperable, but the last time I checked, the, the, the released lib C++ that Apple releases contains like two-thirds of an actual C++ standard library. The exception handling stuff, the, um, dynam the RTTI stuff is all part of a proprietary Apple library. So it, it, it's, it's really two-thirds of a standard library. Is unless more of it's been written, which may be the case, I think compiler RT may contain some of that these days. Um, but m to my knowledge, there's still portions of the GCC um, code that would have to be used. I certainly think that there's zero chance that libc++ would work with um, GCC because GCC is not C++11 compliant enough um, to use uh, that. So, right. A year or two ago, it was very hairy to use Clang um, in any form on Linux uh, because of standard library issues. And libc++ is not a perfect solution because there are part parts that were missing to it. So actually, I've been playing around with that for just a couple of weeks ago. The status is GCC can compile libc++, but uh, for some reason, as soon as you start using local facets, uh, the application using it crashes. I didn't get to investigate what's exactly going on there, but GCC 4.8 otherwise is ready to compile it. And the simple stuff that doesn't use locales actually works. And GCC can actually uh, produce binaries that link to a Clang compiled version of libc++. So that's a little bit hairy. It might cause some weird issues, but it seems to work for the most part. I imagine the largest place where you'd run into problems would be with the, uh, the threading library, the C++ 11 threading library. That would be my guess as to where you'd have the most uh, incompatibilities. All right, we're getting towards the end of our session here. Any other questions? No? Well, thank you very much, Bernhard. Um, we're on to our last talk now before lunch.